Okay. You may begin. You may commence. Welcome, everyone. My name is Siki Gislason, and I'm the president of the European Association of Geochemistry. Now, in 1996, the Chemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry established the honorary title of Geochemistry Fellow to be bestowed upon outstanding scientists who have, over some years, made a major contribution to the field of geochemistry. Together with Robert Rudnick, the president of the Geochemical Society, I'm honored to present the 2019 inductees to this prestigious group. First, we would like to thank the members of the Fellow Award Committee for their remarkable work assessing more than 60 nominations. The pool of nominees was particularly strong this year, and we are grateful to the committee for giving us an excellent class of fellows. We also thank all those who sent in nomination. Taking time to nominate a colleague for an honor like this is an act of real generosity. We invite you to submit the nomination for next year's award by October 31. We especially encourage nomination reflecting the diversity in gender and geography. You can find more information on either society's website. Roberta, the floor is yours. This year's Geochemistry Fellows are Nicola Dafa of the University of Chicago for his contributions to our understanding of the diversity, and Nicola, please come up, uh, diversity of nucleosynthetically distinct components present in the early solar system, their role in the assembly of the Earth, and the time scales and mechanisms of planetary scale differentiation, and for his leadership in developing the techniques and methods that underlie the application of isotope geo and cosmochemistry. Jean Jouzel of the Laboratory of Climate Science and Environment for his pioneering role in using water isotopologues for reconstructing climate changes from polar ice cores with associated atmospheric modeling using both dynamically simple and general circulation models, a research which has been key to understanding of the complex relationship between Earth's climate and natural forcings, including that by greenhouse gases measured in ice cores. Jack Middleberg of the University of Utrecht for his innovative seminal contributions to understanding elemental cycling and Earth's surface, including the decomposition kinetics and preservation of sedimentary organic carbon, benthic food web dynamics and carbon flow, and global models of diagenetic processes, nutrient regeneration, and ecosystem functioning. Congratulations. Eric Olikers of CNRS Toulouse and the University College London for his major contributions in the predictive description of mineral dissolution precipitation rates in natural systems, which have served as a basis for predicting the behavior of radioactive waste and carbon storage in the subsurface, as well as chemical weathering at the Earth's surface, and for contributions to geochemistry reaching far beyond his scientific production. Daniela Rubato of the University of Bern for revolutionizing the use and application of accessory minerals, particularly in metamorphic rocks, through coordinated microscale analysis of chronology, trace element geochemistry, and stable isotope compositions, which are then calibrated experimentally to provide insight to physiochemical conditions during formation. Yuji Sano, the University of Tokyo, for research accomplishments filled with creativity, exploring aspects of cosmochemistry and geochemistry that were off the beaten path in fields ranging from the evolution of the atmosphere and deep cycling of carbon and nitrogen to dating dinosaur teeth or recording Milankovitch cycles in giant clams. This should be taken as the demonstration that creativity has no bounds in science. Mordecai Moti Stein 
of the Geological Survey of Israel and Hebrew University of Jerusalem for being an idea generator on overdrive with great enthusiasm for geology and a great scientific intuition for being an inspiration to early career scientists and for making important scientific contributions to many fields ranging from Middle East paleoclimate to mantle geochemistry. We would also like to recognize a 2018 fellow who could not attend last year, Susan Trumbor. Susan, are you here? Uh, of the Max Planck Institute at the University of California. Yeah, please come up to the stage. Uh, uh, Max Planck Institute and the University of California, Irvine, for discovering the characteristic time scales of terrestrial carbon cycling, pioneering the use of radiocarbon in earth and environmental sciences, and contributing new understanding of the impacts of landscape processes, land use, and climate on the global carbon cycle. Additionally, we have several fellows who could not be here today, and I will read out their names and their citations. Uh, Sylvie Deneren of CNRS and Sorbonne University for her research on the selective preservation of algal cell walls to form kerogen and the hypothesis that carbonaceous chondrite organic matter derives from solar gases and dust. Melinda Darby Dyer of Mount Holyoke College for her exceptional contributions to research in mineralogy, igneous and metamorphic petrology, her success in developing pioneering analysis techniques, and the extraordinary impact her work has had on both the terrestrial and planetary mineralogy, as well as being an extraordinary mentor to young scientists in many terrestrial and planetary disciplines. Sinti Lee of Rice University, for his diverse, creative, and prolific work his provocative ideas that have inspired debate and action, and his fundamental contributions to the understanding of our planet's continents. Chu Gong Li of the China University of Geosciences for establishing a PT path for the exhumation from very high pressure of a continental block buried during continent-continent collision, as well as for succeeding for the first time to attach a time scale showing that this exhumation process was very rapid and his tremendous mentoring of young Chinese scientists. Barbara Sherwood Lawler of the University of Toronto for pioneering environmental geochemistry methods based on compound specific isotope analysis to detect and monitor the biodegradation of organic pollutants in water. These methods have reshaped the assessment of contaminated sites worldwide and have provided a molecular level technique to improve the uh, sustainability of water resources. And finally, William Schottick of the University of Alberta for his virtuous integration of advanced and novel analytical techniques with unique field methods in unusual areas leading to outstanding contributions in our understanding of the cycling of trace metals and metalloids between the hydrosphere, pedosphere, and atmosphere, an endeavor that requires considerable imagination. So let's give a round of applause to, for those who... Okay, and now we take a photo. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and congr congratulations again. 
Um, I'm very pleased to present another award bestowed jointly by the Geochemical Society and the European Association of Geochemistry, the Paul Gast Lectureship. This honor recognizes outstanding contribution to the geochemistry by mid-career scientists. Paul Werner Gast was the first goldsmith metallist in 1972 and pioneered the study of rare earth elements. This year, we are delighted to present the award to Kari Marcielno from Rice University. And uh, I would like to welcome Derek Vance, the Goldsmith 2019 Science and Organizing Committee co-chair, to come forward and formally introduce Kari. But Kari, congratulations. <laughs> Derek. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Professor Kari Masiello to deliver this year's uh, 2019 GAST lecture. Kari's research probes the uh, intersection between organic geochemistry and microbiology with a focus on the cycling of carbon and nitrogen and water around the environment, surface earth reservoirs, she and her group at Rice develop uh, new tools uh, to do this sort of thing um, and to address questions concerning the mechanism and mechanisms and rates of organic carbon transfer between surface earth reservoirs. Her work intersects with, uh, is, she's not just a geochemist, it inter intersects with uh, microbiology but also with many other facets of environmental science including questions of direct and immediate societal relevance. So recently, she's begun working with a team of synthetic biologists at Rice to port tools from that very rapidly growing field into the earth and environmental sciences. And today, she's going to tell us about some of those new tools and how they can be used to track biogeochemical processes in the earth system. So please join me in welcoming Kari to give the 2019 GAS lecture. Thank you. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak here today. I'm a biogeochemist, and for the last few years, I've been embedded within the synthetic biology community at my university, learning to use their tools for earth system science research. And today, what I'm going to tell you about is the potential applications of some of these tools in our field. I'll give you a brief overview of what we can do now, tell you a little bit about what's possible, and then give you a sense of what we need to move forward. Hmm. So, my talk will follow four parts. There'll be an introduction, and in this introduction, I'll tell you a little bit about synthetic biology, what it is, what it means, how, what are the applications potential for our field. I'll give a couple of examples of applications of synthetic biology in biogeochemistry and geobiology. I'll talk about some of the new tools that are coming out. There's really a fire hose of new tools coming out of the synthetic biology community that, that uh, some of which are highly useful or could be highly useful for us. And then. I'll talk about what we need to port these tools into our community, and I'll begin the conversation about what a um, environmental ethics of synthetic biology would look like. So, as we all know, microbial behaviors drive a number of key earth system processes. For example, the conversion of biomass to either soil or to CO2, that's a microbial decision the production or consumption of N2O and methane, these are microbial decisions, the production of biominerals, ferrohydrite, gertite, the reduction and oxidation of some of the most important elements in our Earth system, like iron and sulfur. Many of these processes are mediated by microbes. 
And one of the grand challenges in our field that, that many of us are working on is understanding how do we connect these micron scale processes to larger scale ecosystem scale or even planetary scale effects. So historically we've made these connections using tools like incubations. And incubations treat microbes as non-specific actors, but, but predictable actors, varying the conditions of their environment and then watching how their behavior changes in response to changes in environmental conditions. And this is fundamentally a box model idea. And it's great, incubations do give us information about how changing environmental conditions lead to changes in behavior, but they're challenging to move into mechanistic observations. We have a powerful new option in our community with the tools that are available from omics. And it's, it's challenging to, to overstate the potential of omics to help us understand how Earth system processes function. I, I picked here a picture from a recent NPR piece on the uh, metagenomics work that has come out of Noah Fuhrer's work, uh, understanding the soil metagenome. And omics, um, while omics offer very powerful tools, they are, like incubations, fundamentally holistic. And a holistic approach to understanding science is great. We, we absolutely need these kinds of holistic perspectives, but they are stronger when paired with a mechanistic reductionist approach. And so if there's a meta message in my talk today, it's that tools like omics are holistic and they can be paired with reductionist tools coming out of the synthetic biology community to together give us a better understanding of how earth system processes work. And so some of the mechanistic questions that the new synthetic biology tools can help us answer. One of the key tools that I'm going to talk about is tools that will help us understand how microbes talk to each other and how they talk to plants. So many of the key biogeochemical fluxes in the Earth system are mediated by microbial conversations. We know almost nothing about how the Earth matrix affects these conversations. Almost all of these conversations happen inside a solid matrix in nutrient-starved conditions. And this is a place where synthetic biology has a lot to offer us. Another sort of grand question in our field is the effects of spatial heterogeneity on, on almost all aspects of Earth processes, but specifically microbial processes. We know that the Earth is spatially heterogeneous on many different scales. From a microbial perspective, it's spatially heterogeneous on the micron scale. And this fundamental heterogeneity is also a key driver in Earth processes. And so simple questions like, What's the detection radius of a microbe? How, how, how big is a microbe's sense of itself and its community? This is also something that synthetic biology can help us understand. And then it turned out when we got started, we didn't think that we were going to be studying evolutionary biology or developing tools for evolutionary biology, but it turned out that the first tool, the easiest tool to develop and bring into our community was a tool to understand the effects of environmental properties on evolution. And so I'll talk, I'll talk about that as well. So these kinds of decisions, a microbe's decision whether or not it's going to make CO2 or make microbial bodies, a microbe's decision whether or not it's going to make methane or N2O or if it's going to eat methane, these are driven by properties that vary on the micron scale. And the properties that are relevant are properties like pH, soil moisture, the concentration of nutrients, the ratio of nutrients, the NP ratio in the environment, the presence or absence of a variety of electron acceptors and donors, and many other properties. And this heterogeneity makes it really hard for us to take a bulk measurement and then scale up. So I'm gonna pivot here and tell you about, give you a very broad introduction to synthetic biology and then talk about some applications uh, of these tools in earth system science. So synthetic biology conceives of life as a catalog, a, just a giant catalog that we can shop in of useful genetic software, software that's programmed to do something. We are all of all of us who are alive, we are all carrying a vast system of detectors to understand our environment. And the simplest and 
most easily ported tool into our community is that of these living biosensors. So microbes whose ability to detect something is coupled to genetic code that reports on it. So we simply ask microbes to say, yes, I saw this compound, or yes, I executed this metabolic step. The difference between a a unprogrammed organism and a programmed organism is that the programmed organism has a second bit of genetic code inserted in it that reports on what they see, and it reports in a way that we can detect. And so the, the image that, I've, that I have up here is from an early study that my group did using the very traditional biomedical suite of reporter options. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you more about this specific study in a little bit, but the thing I want you to take away from this image, hopefully you can see the, the red and green fluorescence in it. Uh, we coded microbes to tell us about their perceptions of their environment and what they were doing by glowing different colors. And this is a classic biochemistry, biomedical reporter suite. So the classic way to ask, to, the classic way to get microbes to tell you about their life experiences is to, to code them to glow. So a biosensor is a microbe that's programmed to report on its environment or report on its behavior. And you can think of a biosensor just like you think about any other kind of gadget that you might have in your lab. I put a pH meter up here. So a biosensor has a sensor. It has a suite of genetic code that senses something, which is analogous to, oh, well, it worked there. Analogous to the pH meter here, a biosensor has a reporter, so analogous to the digital readout on a pH meter. In this case, the sensor is detecting some compound in the reporter here. In this cartoon, I have the reporter releasing a gas, and I'll talk more about the potential for gas reporters in Earth System Science. But there's something that's implicit in this that's not, uh, not obvious to us, we don't think about when we look at something like a pH meter, and that's that a sensor has a chassis. So this pH meter hangs on something. It's a thing that holds the sensor and reporter together. And in the synthetic biology community, microbes are conceived of as the chassis for the genetic code. So the code is held within a chassis organism. And the classic chassis organisms in synthetic biology in the microbial community, the classic organism is E. coli. There's a lot we can do with E. coli, but again, as I'm sure all of you who have worked with actual real environmental microbes know, E. coli is not an ideal representative of um, almost any microbe relevant to biogeochemical processes. So I'll talk more about this later. So the simplest biosensor can be thought of as an if-then circuit. If you detect something, then do something. And I have up here a schematic from a paper by T. Khan et al. in 2006, and I want to just call out this paper because it's a great introductory paper to biosensors in Earth System Science. Uh, and I, I, I like this schematic because it does a great job showing us how, what, what happens here. So a compound in the environment diffuses, or in some cases is transported through the cell wall. It binds to a transcriptional regulator, kicks on the production of a protein, and so remember in the background here, the central dogma of biology, DNA makes RNA, which makes protein. And so what we have here is when the concentration of this compound in the environment rises above a threshold level, the microbe begins to express a reporter, in this case, green fluorescent protein. And the reporter that you're seeing here, the, the um, Synthetic biologists would call this a transfer function. Those of us who work in analytical chemistry labs would call it a calibration curve. So microbes have calibration curves, just like your ion chromatograph or your gas chromatograph or your HPLC. And this calibration curve, this transfer function, has all of the things that we would think of as a uh, a detection as an instrument would have. It has a detection limit. There's a threshold below which the microbe doesn't see. There's a signal range. There's a point where the signal saturates. And you can increase the amount of signal you're putting in, and you don't get any more signal out. There's also, in some cases, background signals. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the challenge of green fluorescent protein in the environment. GFP has all kinds of background problems. And all of these properties are tunable. There's a field of protein engineering that is capable of tuning the shape of this curve, the width of it, the saturation point, and the detection limit. 
in this case, the response curve that you're looking at is linear. And this is a, um, a cartoon schematic. Most microbial transfer functions are not linear. Most of them are sigmoidal. Or they can also be step functions. And in the case of a step function, we're no longer talking about an if-then circuit. We're talking about a, a logic. We're talking about a, uh, an on-off switch. These circuits can become more complex. As I just said, you can have an if-then circuit. You have, can have an on-off switch. You can have a toggle switch so that the expression of the reporter doesn't stop when the signal goes away. It's a permanent, I saw it, and I report forever for the rest of my life. We can have stacked circuits, so we can have an and circuit. If I see carbon and I see nitrogen and it triggers the expression of this particular metabolic pathway, then I report. And so this, this uh, the complexity, the logical complexity of genetic circuitry is expanding rapidly, and this allows us to begin to test some fairly complicated hypotheses that are coming out of omics, the, the, the holistic view that we get from omics. So a biosensor can be used as a chemical detector. It can be used just very simply, just replace your HPLC with a biosensor. And answer the question, is a compound present and what's the concentration present? And this is being done already. I'll show you a number of studies that are doing this. It can be used as a code debugger, so we can use biosensors to understand if a sequence of genetic code has been expressed. We can ask a microbe to report on this expression. These two are implicitly different in their use of the chassis organism. So a chemical detector, you could use an E. coli as a chassis organism to ask a question about a compound in the environment. And so that does not require the ability to engineer a, um, a specific strain of organism. A code debugger does. Code debuggers brings us into this question of the genetic tractability of the, the chassis organism. We can use biosensors to report on whether or not genetic material is being transferred in the environment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then one interesting technology that I'm not going to talk a lot about, but I want to be sure to tell you, is that microbes can be coded to report on their memory. So they can be coded to say, to say yes, I saw this, or yes, I had this experience, and, and change just a little bit of their genetic code to mark permanently their, their historic life experience. So the first example I want to give you is an early study, and I, I, saw, I showed you a little bit of data from this already. Uh, we looked at how, what was the effect of surface area of charcoal on the ability of microbes to talk to each other. And the communication molecule, molecule that we used was an acyl homoserine lactone. Acyl homoserine lactones are uh, ubiquitous communication molecules used by gram-negative bacteria. So this is how gram-negative bacteria plan their activities. They talk to each other. Pseudomonas coordinates aspects of denitrification with this. Um, aspects of the rhizobial infection of plant roots are coordinated by, uh, by AHLs. And this, imp importantly, this particular suite of machinery, the acyl homoserine lactone machinery, has been horizontally transferred to archaea, and it's used in the coordination of methanogenesis as well. So we were interested in whether or not different types of earth materials interfered with the ability of microbes to plan their behaviors. So we built two synthetic microbes. The first one was a sender organism, and it did nothing but send out an acyl homoserine lactone signal. And when it did that, it glowed red. So this is a sensor that's reporting on its expression of its gene. And then we built a, green mi a microbe that glowed green when it heard the signal. And then using the complex setup that you can see here, this is the second generation. The first generation was built with Legos that we stole from my kid. Uh, we imprinted two wells into a Petri dish. We filled one with agar that was loaded with an environmental material in a, in a concentration that was that made, that made environmental sense, and the other one we filled with, uh, with un, unadulterated agar. We put the sender organism in the middle of those two wells. So the sender is here, and then we put receivers on either side. And then we ratioed the signal of these two receivers to understand the effect of this material on the ability of microbes to talk to each other. Okay, what did we see? We saw that as the surface area of charcoal goes up, it becomes increasingly effective at impeding the, the, impeding the ability of microbes to talk to each other. So 
microbes release this signal, it's called a quorum sensing signal, to assess the size of their community and then plan decisions based on it. And what we learned here is that as charcoal surface area and concordantly pH uh, shifts, the ability of microbes in the environment of this charcoal to talk to each other gets slowly shut off. And we got a little bonus in this particular study. And the bonus that we got here is that uh, uh, the biosensor worked at a threshold that was about two orders of magnitude lower than the gas chromatograph that we happened to have in the lab. And so the first thing that happened was uh, one of the researchers working on the project said to me, I can't, I can't validate the results because the GCMS won't go low enough to match the biosensor's performance. And this, this should make, it should make sense to you that the biosensor is so much more sensitive and is tuned at the right range because microbes need machinery that allows them to hear each other at the range that they're talking. And so in this particular case, in this particular configuration, the biosensor is working better than a GCMS because, it's, because, we have, um, because we've used the code that was right for the problem. So the second example I want to give you is a project that's in revision right now. Elena Del Valle, uh, one of our PhD students in Tara Webster, who's a postdoc at uh, University of Colorado, have been working on understanding the effects of soil organic matter on the ability of plants to talk to their microbial symbionts. So the compound that they examined, they actually examined a, a large class of compounds called flavonoids, and they wanted to know what, what the effect of soil organic matter was on the ability of plants <coughs> to call to their symbionts. <coughs> so, <coughs> Plants use neuringenin, which is one particular flavonoid, to, to, send out a, um, to send out a signal to organisms like rhizobia and say, hey, we've got great space built in our roots. We're ready. Move in. Come in. Start fixing nitrogen for us. We need the nitrogen that you're going to make for us. Here you can see this is the calibration curve for the HPLC. And this is the calibration curve for the biosensor, the transfer function for the biosensor. And so this biosensor, we didn't get that nice bonus that its detection range was any different than the HPLC. Its performance was the same as the HPLC in this case. It is doing one thing differently, though. It's telling us what's going on from the, from the perception of the microbe, not from the perception of the HPLC. So you can imagine that an HPLC extraction could give you information that's actually only a proxy for what the microbe is really seeing. And so the biosensor is telling us actually what the microbe can see. So what did Elena and Tara find? They found that as the concentration of organic carbon goes up in a soil, the ability of, that, of plants in that soil to call to their symbionts drops. And that might seem counterintuitive to you because we, we have this belief that high soil organic matter is good and increasing symbiosis is good. And how could it be evolutionarily that plants have evolved a communication molecule that's vulnerable to interference from something in their natural environment? But evolutionarily, this actually makes a lot of sense. So these um, rhizobial symbionts are an extremely expensive tenant. Uh, rhizobium Rhizobial symbiosis can draw down as much as 30% of a plant's photosynthate. So this is a, this is a tenant who is um, costing the landlord a lot of money right now. So <laughs> soil organic matter, it turns out, is another source of nitrogen. And if a microbe had a way to shut that call signal off, when it had a, a cheaper source of nutrients, well, that would be a good thing. And so what we can take from this is that the ability of microbes to hear that plant call drops as plants have access to a better source of nitrogen. This is actually the first panel of Elena and Tara's paper. They go on to uh, get at exactly what the mechanism is through which this call disruption occurs. It's mediated, it's a, the, the exact disruption is occurring through an organic molecule that's secreted by fresh, print, fresh plant litter, <clears throat> and it's mediated by soil metals. It creates a dimer that um, binds the signal and destabilizes it. And I, I won't show you the organic chemistry of that, but 
uh, you can, I hope, read the paper soon. So before I move on to the, the things that are coming in terms of biosensors, I want to take a minute to acknowledge work that's done by some other groups. There's been, we are, we are by no means the, the first or even, uh, there, there are many groups that have used biosensors in a traditional manner to understand Earth system processes. I particularly want to point out Mary Firestone's group at UC Berkeley, Mary Firestone, um, Mary Firestone's PhD student, Kristen DeAngelis, who's a uh, faculty now, did a great job assembling a suite of biosensors to detect nitrate in the rhizosphere of soils. One of my favorite papers here that, that I have not seen used yet is a, a, a biosensor that detects soil water potential. So you can put a microbe in a soil and it'll tell you what it thinks the water potential of its environment is. I'm, I'm so excited for someone to find a use for this particular biosensor. In the marine environment, I want to mention Laura Mello's work. She's been working on understanding the effects of acyl homocerine lactones on the degradation of particulate organic matter in the marine system. This is, she showed that the acyl these gram-negative communication molecules manage how sinking particulate organic matter is released into the marine environment. And then just this year, there's a suite of papers that have begun coming out on biosensors used to detect heavy metals in the environment. And these are metals in high concentrations, and hopefully I'll have the opportunity to tell you why high concentration metals are a much easier problem than low concentration metals in terms of biosensors. But if I don't have time to tell you that, I'll say it right now. High concentration metals are an easy problem. Low concentration metals are a hard problem. I think we're going to be able to find a way around it with some new technology that's coming out. Okay, so biosensor tools were developed in biomedicine, and this profoundly limits how we can use them in Earth system applications. And the most basic problem is the mismatch between the output code and, the, and Earth materials. And the simplest way to understand that is that you can't see fluorescence in a soil. Your reporter organism can be glowing its heart out, and you're not going to be able to see it in a soil or a marine system. The, the less obvious problem is that green fluorescence protein requires oxygen to mature, and many of us are interested in biogeochemical, geobiological processes that occur in the absence of oxygen. The second problem, which has probably already occurred to you, is that most biosystem, biosensor chassis don't survive in anything remotely like a natural system. They don't, E. coli, e. coli laboratory E. coli is a fragile flower that dies as soon as, as, soon as the, your soils begin to dry out and it can't survive at all in seawater. And then I also wanna uh, mention that earth materials are complicated. So the first thing we set at in our team is to think about a new class of biosensors that will work for earth system questions. So the first thing, I asked for as a biogeochemist was a volatile gas. I want to be done with this whole glowing business. We need a gas that we can watch that comes out of the headspace of an incubation chamber that gives us a real-time readout on microbial behavior. So my fantasy reporter, reporter is a volatile gas. It needs to be cheap and easy to measure. It needs to be non-toxic. It needs to be uh, it needs to diffuse out of soil and marine sediments without binding to anything. I don't want to have to deal with any dissolution or binding. It needs to be absent in soil, so something that's not made by any organism. It needs to be encoded by a single gene so that we don't have to deal with patching together lots of different sequences and getting something to get something to work. It needs to be made with something that's common, an easy metabolite. And as a bonus, we need a pair of gases. And it, it's not intuitively obvious why we need gases in a pair, but if you put on your isotope geochemistry brain, think about how we use ratios of gases and that that's central. And in, in a similar way, it turns out that it's, it's going to be central that we be able to ratio our gas concentrations. And I'll talk more about that in this next slide. So just as we have a fluorescent palette, Roger Chen receives a Nobel for the development of the fluorescent palette in biosensors, we need a gas palette for the earth sciences. There are lots of potential gases that genetic code exists to make. Uh, and so I think the potential for a big palette of gases is promising. The first gases that we're starting with are methyl bromide, methyl chloride. I don't like methyl iodide. We haven't actually used methyl iodide. We have the capability to use it, but we haven't been using it. And ethylene. So these are all imperfect. 
Methyl halides do, however, have the advantage of being encoded by a single gene. They have a common metabolite. They, have, they, they do diffuse out of the system rapidly. And importantly, they're made under low and no oxygen conditions just fine. So as you look at these potential reporter gases, you may have some questions. So the first question you may have is, what about background? I thought there were organisms that make methyl halides, and that's true. There's a potential for some background in marine systems here. It turns out, however, that the background in soils for methyl bromide is lower than for green fluorescent protein. So it turns out that there's a, a challenge with green fluorescent protein autofluorescence in cells. And so one of the side effects of, of this study is that we've been able to report that methyl bromide works as a detector for biosensors better than green fluorescent protein. So, and I'm going to talk about this second challenge. What happens if the microbes reproduce? This is a significant problem, and this is where the two gases come in. And then I'll briefly mention what happens if the signal gets eaten. So there's absolutely the potential that all of these signals will be consumed by other organisms in the community. All right. So how do we deal with population change? So you have a signal, you have an if-then signal. If I see this, then I, then I release a compound. But what if that microbe is growing? What if your pH meter is reproducing during the experiment and your signal goes up because you're getting a larger signal? Or concordantly, what, or con what, what, if, what if your pH meter dies and you don't get any signal? How do you know, how do you know that there's something's really happened? And so we've begun to talk about one gas and two gas experiments. So a one gas experiment, gives you information that's dependent on the population size. And sometimes we want this kinds of information, and this is, this is particularly valuable when we want information about um, evolution or reproduction of microbes under some circumstances. And then in a two-gas experiment, we have a constitutive gas that's always on. So we always, microbes are constantly making one gas, and then we have a conditional gas that only goes on when something happens. And we ratio those two to understand the concentration. So I said earlier that the easiest problem for us, the first problem that turned out to be easiest, was understanding horizontal gene transfer in soils and sediments. And that was because this is a one gas problem. And so our first tool, we first developed a one gas system. This is interesting because we might want to know how the properties of the environment of a microbe change its ability to transfer genetic information. And this is relevant for everything from how do rhizobia trade nitrogen-fixing plasmids in soils to questions like how is antibiotic resistance traded among organisms in wastewater treatment plants. All of these require, the use of synthetic biology in all of these types of systems requires a reporter that can be visualized or can be detected in a matrix that is dark. So how we dealt with this, Shelley Chang, a recent PhD student in our group, built two strains of E. coli. The first E. coli had the gas reporting code on a plasmid, but the expression of that plasmid was repressed by the chromosomally. So the, so the start condition was an organism that has the genetic code, but it can't express it, and another organism that doesn't have the genetic code. And so the only way you get a gas signal is if horizontal gene transfer has occurred. So the only way that you know, the only way that, that this signal comes out is if there has been some genetic transfer of information. And so what Shelley showed is the traditional method of measuring transconjugants. And so the verbiage on this slide is the transconjugant colony forming units here which are measured by plating out and then counting colonies. This is a highly destructive method. You can sample your system once and you're done. This response looks exactly like we have a really nice linear relationship with the methyl bromide release, which is an indicator of the, um, the transfer of this genetic information. So this tool is ready to go. This is ready to test the evolutionary effects of changes in nutrient status changes in environmental chemistry, pH, water, and really importantly, wet drying cycles. I can't overstate the, the central, the, the dogma right now is that uh, NP ratio is what controls genetic transfer in the environment. But anybody who's ever been outdoors can tell you that 
if two parts of a soil are not hydraulically connected, you're probably not going to see genetic transfer of organisms. So I think this is going to be a really important application of this tool. So a two-gas problem is one that's a little bit different. It asks the question, what's, the micro what's a microbe's perception of the concentration of something in its environment? And in this case, the population of your reporter organisms will, can grow or shrink with time. And this is one of those problems where we have to normalize to population using two gases. And so again, I'm going to come back to this problem of acyl homoserine lactones, which are these communication molecules used by gram-negative organisms ubiquitously to manage their behavior and a communication system that's been horizontally transferred to at least some archaea for use in managing methanogenesis. So, for example, what kinds of things do AHL, does the AHL communication mediate? It mediates the formation of biofilms. It mediates organisms' choice to form spores. It mediates rhizobia. They're, as rhizobia plan their nitrogen fixation, they have five different AHLs. So that's sort of a non, it's a, that's a non-trivial, uh, management system. And then finally, AHLs, Laura Mello's work has showed that AHLs are important in the breakdown of particulate organic carbon in marine systems. They have, they all have this lactone ring, and the chain length here varies, and that variation in chain length is important in the next slide that I'll show you. So, just because a compound is present in the environment doesn't mean that a microbe can see it. And just because a microbe can see a compound in one matrix doesn't mean it's going to be able to see a compound in another matrix. And that's what Shelley Chang showed here in this, uh, in this particular study. She looked at the ability of biosensors to, to hear the acyl homoserine lactone signal in a liquid media and in a soil system. In this case, it's a, um, a loamy alpha sol from Kellogg Biological Station in Michigan. And she looked at how that signal varies both as a function of the media and as a function of the chain length of the signal. And what she found is that this 3-oxo, so three carbons on the tail here, this signal comes through fine in a liquid media and comes through fine in soils. But as soon as you have this longer 12-carbon chain, the signal is muted in soils. And so we can see here the importance of looking at the matrix as we think about the ability of microbes to talk to each other. The matrix is really important. I know I'm not telling anybody, any, an audience of earth scientists is likely not surprised that <laughs> the earth matrix is an important characteristic regulating the ability of microbes to do things. So the next thing we really need, we need growth matrices that are appropriate and we need growth media that are appropriate. And so as we began to think about applying these tools in, tools in soils, one of the first things we, we realized is that there's no right soil. Every soil is its own wonderful, unique snowflake in terms of characteristics. And the same thing is probably true for marine sediments, although we don't have them sampled at the density that we have soil sampled. And because every special, every soil is its own special thing, it's almost impossible to call one soil the right sample or the right standard or the characteristic sample. And this makes doing controlled experiments in the lab quite challenging. And the other issue is that most microbes in the environment are not living in rich media. They're starved. They're hungry. They're living in something that does not look at all like um, uh, the kinds of things that E. coli eat in the environment. And so, so we need media that are appropriate for this. And I, I'm not going to talk about the development of soil-appropriate media, but this is, I do want to mention this is something that Trent Northern's group at uh, JGI is working on. I will, however, talk about the development of artificial soils. And so we need options that are somewhere between the petri dish and the real environment. So the petri dish and flasks, they're great. That gives us a fully controllable system, and it is completely unrepresentative of anything an environmental microbe sees. Soils, super interesting, but as I said, every soil is its own snowflake. It's, it's hard to argue that any soil is representative of anything. And so what we really need are tools that allow us to work in this space. And I'm going to talk about Elena Del Valle's work uh, along with Jadon Gao and my group, building artificial soils. 
So what we decided to do, we, did the, we used the thing we have a lot of in Texas. There's a lot of fracking sand in Texas. And so fracking sand, it turns out, is made to be highly monodispersed. And uh, so we began with a base of silicon dioxide, highly monodispersed silicon dioxide, so we could control the grain size. We could control the soil texture perfectly. So, so Elena and Zhao Dong are working on what is essentially a build your own adventure, artificial soil. You start by choosing the grain size, you add the minerals that you want to study or not. Maybe you, maybe you want to understand how the system works in the absence of iron. Maybe you want to understand the effects of iron two on uh, microbial behavior. You set the pH. We know pH is the master variable in many environmental processes. You aggregate. If you're working with soils, you aggregate. And that's because the ped structure of a soil is an essential component of a soil. A soil is not a soil unless it's aggregated. And so we've developed a suite of different approaches to create soil aggregates. And then you add the right medium, a medium that allows an organism to grow at a rate that you want in the experiment that you're doing. The last tool that I want to talk about that is super important and just really exciting, I think will be very useful for our community, is what gets called cell-free synthetic biology. And so, okay, so you'll hear, you'll hear synthetic biologists call these cell-free sensors, you'll hear them called TXTL systems, or sometimes you'll hear them called paper-based sensors. And this is because in 2014, the party group discovered that biosensors still work even after they're dead. So you can take your biosensor, grow it up in the lab where it's fat and happy, and then you can lice it. You can freeze dry it onto a piece of paper, make it shelf stable, and then you have, a, you have the dead machinery, and then you can drop the fluid that you want to measure the concentration of some compound in onto your, your paper disc and get a reading. In fact, it turns out that you don't even need to build the whole system in the biosensor as a living organism. You can simply take lysate from your favorite microbe, E. coli, because it's easy to grow in lab, and pair it with a DNA sequence that you order online that detects some compound. Mix the two together, freeze dry it on your piece of paper, and you've built a paper-based method for measuring a metabolite. So, this is, a, this is potentially a completely new way to do metabolomics in the environment, a p like measuring metabolites in the environment as we measure pH. This is, um, we're, we're just beginning to see these tools developed with some, some compounds that are interesting to earth system science. But this, this community that builds these, these uh, cell-free systems could really use some input, some dialogue from us. So if you happen to be at a university where you know some synthetic biologists, that's the conversation to have with them. You say, I want to use your TXTL systems to measure something. So what are our needs? And I promised I would say something about ethics as well. So what are the needs of an Earth system focused synthetic biology. So the first order in ethics that I want to be sure to say is that as we use living biosensors, they are for laboratory use. Their fate should be death in an autoclave. These are not organisms that we plan to deploy in the environment. As we begin to think about these paper-based sensors, we can begin a conversation about whether or not these, these freeze-dried microbial guts should be able to leave the laboratory and under what conditions. And then I want to say that, that the, the synthetic biology community has a great group of folks who are talking about ethics. I'm not, that this is, this is a, a, something they're, they're really thinking hard about. But one area that has not been thoroughly explored is what it is, is this connection with ecology and biogeochemistry. So this is not a community that speaks the native language of ecology or biogeochemistry, and their work will be greatly improved by some dialogue with the rest of us who have those skills. Hypothesis design is problematic if you don't really understand how the Earth system works. So 
In conclusion, synthetic biology can help us address some of the grand challenges in Earth system science. We can, we can begin to ask how, what, what genes are being expressed, how a microbe perceives the concentration of materials in its environment. Uh, in the future, we can ask microbes to blog about their participation in cryptic processes, and I particularly want to uh, recommend a talk that will occur on Friday. A postdoc in my research group, David Sheese, will talk about the use of an iron-sensing microbe to understand cryptic iron cycling in the Earth system. And then these more complex logic circuits begin to evolve. So why should you use a biosensor? It allows you to see the world from the view of a microbe. It allows you to gather real-time behavior on microbial behavior. And sometimes biosensors will give you information that's actually more accurate. And then again, here's the information about David's talk on using biosensors to detect elements involved in cryptic cycles. In conclusion, in terms of bringing these tools in, we really need some cross-conversation so that the tools the synthetic biology community builds actually work in, the, in, the real, in real samples. So for example, dissolved organic matter fluoresces. This makes it hard to use any kind of fluorescent reporter in a marine system. Salinity kills E. coli. We need some chassis organisms that can survive under marine conditions. So we need this ongoing conversation. And then Finally, in acknowledgement, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources and the wonderful people in my research group and in Joff Silberg's research group. Thank you. Thank you, Kari. That was fantastic. I love the idea of blogging microbes. Uh, we have some time for uh, questions. Uh, there are some mics um, in the middle on, on the stairs. Can you see anything? I can't see a thing now. <laughs> Is everyone too hungry? Okay, uh, well, th there's one, uh, there's one here. Is that one? Ah, can you get to a mic? I, I do have a question here. Uh, right, so I was wondering about the use of methyl halides, uh, which will hydrolyze in water and are very powerful methylating agents. So you could imagine you know, some, some very quick uh, reaction with organic molecules so that you might not see the full signal of basically the sensor gas that you're looking for. Yes, so um, the solubility is low enough that when we're working in soil systems, we, we get a nice response. So our response curve is okay. There, there is certainly some dissolution, but, but we can generate a response curve that's calibrated to, the, the, uh, to account for that dissolution. The uh, issue of attacking organic matter and potentially attacking the host organism, we, one, of the, one of the tests that you do as you develop a synthetic organism is you test to see if it functions okay with the genetic code that you've added on board. So you test its growth versus the growth of an organism that has, versus the growth of the native, uh, the, the wild type organism. And for the sensors that we've built that use methyl bromide as a, a reporting gas, the amount of methyl bromide that's coming out as a reporting gas is low enough that it, we're not seeing any toxicity. The two, the wild type organism versus the engineered organism show identical growth rates. All right, thanks. There's one over there. Yeah, I, I would like to know if it's possible to account for the effects of pleiotropism, uh, unseemly related genes controlling other phenotypic traits. I'm going to need you to tell me what pleiotropism is. So, yes, uh, so genes that have un un unseemly, they control other phenotype traits. So you will have, for instance, 
uh, genes that you are not accounting for that might have uh, another response to something that you change in the genetic code. Okay, so can you give me an example of how that would be uh, either a problem or a benefit? Well, uh, something that might generate an, an effect and might be a, a, like uh, analogous to a signal-to-noise ratio or generating noise in your, uh, well, experiments. Okay, so in terms of watching for noise in the experiments, um, <clears throat> we watch for noise in a bunch of different ways. So we watch for what gets called a leaky circuit. So does the, is the off switch really off? And sometimes, is there something else that's kicking it on? And that can increase the background or create noise in the system. And then we watch for um, responses to compounds that are not, uh, not the compound of interest. So for example, uh, acylhemosine lactone reporter that's supposed to report on a 12 carbon chain, but actually also senses a six or a three carbon chain, we watch for noise in that manner. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I'd be really happy to talk with you more about this to make sure I get it right. Okay, thank you. Here, yeah, a, a question. Uh, I saw in the list some uh, compounds based on selenium and tellurium. Oh, in the, um, the scent of, a, vol the scent yes. of a microbe paper, yes. Can you c comment on this? not beyond the fact that genetic code exists to make these compounds and that that could be repurposed as a sensor if, we, if that was something that somebody wanted to do. Okay. Uh, we, okay, one, one more quick one, yeah. Yeah, um, the, the issue about making the artificial soils, I would just um, caution you that that's been tried a lot in the environmental community and seems to work mechanistically, but it creates a lot of variance um, that soils are highly formulated, and so that's manifested both in its chemical and physical behaviors, and that seems like that would directly influence a lot of the signals and reporting that you get. So, I mean, one alternative is to consider uh, soils based upon class, such as the soils you have in Michigan are very different from the soils in uh, Texas but there's a certain class behavior associated with them that could essentially help to capture some of the variation that you would see and give you a little more structure in that uh, response. There's absolutely room for doing experiments in real soils. I completely agree with you. And um, it's, it is in fact true there's a large body of literature on artificial soils already, although constructing them de novo has not been done before as far as I'm aware. We can talk more about that. Um, I'd be interested to hear the specific literature that, that you're thinking of. Okay, yep. Okay, I think we uh, better leave it there. Before we, before we thank Kari again, just a reminder, if you've, uh, if you've signed up for Meet, Meet the Plenary, you can talk more to Kari, and that's in room M213, starting now. Okay, thank you.